Father, we just honor you in this place, and we continue to honor you. And Lord, we pray that you will be honored and glorified and lifted up, Lord God, to the highest level through tonight's Torah share. In Jesus' mighty name, we all pray, and all God's saints say, Amen. 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 Well, God bless you all. Let's give, uh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, tonight's share or teaching is entitled, The Creation Code to Your Destiny. And God has a code to each and every one of your destinies. How many of you would like to unlock the code? Unlock the code that will propel you into God's highest calling in your lives. God wants to take you leaps and bounds in the anointing. There's no limit to where God wants to take you. God wants to, God wants to use you like, you like you can never imagine. And tonight's share is entitled The Creation Code to Your Destiny. This is for May 17, 2018. And tonight we're going to talk about the formation of destiny. We're going to talk about how God will use your painful past and launch you into, his high, into a, high, a high calling. And you're going, to, you're going to discover the purpose of your life through the blueprint of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and through the scroll of Esther or through Megillah Esther. Amen? So how many of you are excited about tonight? You're excited about the Torah. Amen? The more the excitement, the, the, the more the reverence for God's word, the more the hunger, the more you're going to receive. And tonight, I'm, I'm believing God that you are, God is going to catapult you, leaps and bounds in the anointing. Because God wants to use each and every one of you in the anointing. God wants to use you, and, and he, he, wants to, he wants to raise you up as kings and priests in these last days. Amen? Amen. So we are, I'm going to teach you about the formation of destiny. We're going to begin by talking, I'm going to actually cover several different points tonight, but I'm going to begin to you, begin by speaking about the purpose of creation. And one thing I would like to announce, because this will really help you, if you haven't read my book already, Destined for Torah, The Final Countdown. In the book, The Final Countdown, I talk about your destiny in the final countdown of creation. Amen? And I love the song from the band Europe, that the song, The Final Countdown. This really speaks, uh, I've probably reinvented that song to, to, to define what God is doing with this church in these last days. And God wants to use each and every one of us, and, and he wants to take us to the ends of the earth. He wants to use us in end time ministry. He wants to use each and every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest. God wants to use each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to call upon Dr. Vicky, if you'll come up, please. And you can just read from my, from my, from my notes here, if you like. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we're, I'm going to ask you to keep a finger in, in Genesis chapter 1 and also keep another finger in, within um, uh, Ruth chapter 1. We're, we're going to go back and forth between these two books. Amen? So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we're only going to read one verse to start with. Dr. Vicki. Ready to begin. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's read that one more time. All together. In the beginning, Ready to begin. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Excellent. Thank you. And Dr. Vicki, you'll be running back and forth a lot this evening. If you want to, you can probably, um, grab a chair instead of my right side, but what, what, however you're comfortable. So, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There is there are volumes set within this one verse alone. And um, if you haven't read my book, The Final Countdown, I truly encourage you to get the book. It's available right now on Amazon.com. Just search for my name or search for Destin Fatora or search for The Final Countdown. You'll find the book. So you can get it on Amazon. I'll try and bring some on next Monday evening, which I, I, I can make available to you. I can, you know, make them available to you after the service next week. I forgot to bring them tonight. But it's really going to help you understand my, my opinion of what took place in Genesis chapter 1. And if you can listen to countless teachers, and they're all going to give you a different perspective on Genesis chapter 1. But my perspective is the correct one. No, I'm just joking. What I will share with you is my opinion. I'm going to give you my opinion of from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you look at the, the, um, the Jewish translations, they read, In the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth. The word heavens is in the plural, the word earth is in the singular. And the way I interpret that ver the verse is, in the beginnings, so this is the start of God creating. 
The heavens speak about multi, speak about spiritual realms. Can you say spiritual realms? Spiritual realms. And the earth speaks about not just the planet Earth. It speaks about all of the physical creation. Amen. Can you uh, can you follow me so far? All right. So in the beginning of God of God's creation of the heavens and the earth. Now we we always interpret that God dwells in the spiritual realm and we. And the angels are in the spiritual realm and that we're in the physical realm. I want to give you something that's going to contradict that opinion. God exists in a realm that's above the spiritual and above the earth realm. Because God created the spiritual realm and the physical realm for all of us. And tonight as I'm preaching to you, you are going to enter into an anointing. You are going to enter into a calling. You are going to learn what your purpose is in this earth. Amen? Not one of you is here by a random uh, chance. You're not here by chance. You are here by divine design. Amen. God ordained for each and every one of you to live in the earth during this time. Amen? So in the beginning of God's creating of the heavens and the earth, God created the heavens and the earth for the sake of His Torah. That is the, one of the, that's probably one of the main reasons why God created the creation is that His Torah may dwell below. Amen? And quoting from Habad, it reads, God created the heavens and the earth for the sake of the Torah, which is the beginning of His way. What is His way? His way is found in Proverbs 8.22, which reads, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way before His works of old. But so for the sake of the Torah, for the sake of the Word of God, the creation exists. Amen? And we are part of God's plan in the creation. We are part of God's plan to spread the Torah throughout the earth. Amen? That's why I call the theme of the service destined for Torah, because your destination is Torah. Amen? Amen. We don't, so, so everything that we do, all that we live for, is found in the Torah. And my definition of Torah, of course, the literal definition of Torah is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Hebrew, the words are Barishas, Shemot, Vayikra, Bamidbar, and Devarim. The five books of Moses are the Torah. Amen? And the, the definition I like to use is the entire Bible is Torah. Genesis through Revelation, interpreted through rabbinic eyes, is the Torah. Amen? And through the rabbinic, and we look at the word of God through the lenses, through the eyes of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, one of, the, one of the rabbis, Shimon Hazadik, who was one of the remnants of the, of the uh, Great Assembly, he used to say, on three things the world stands. Can you say three things? Three things. The first thing is Torah. Let's all, let's all say it together. The Torah. The Torah. The second is service to God. And number three is acts of human kindness. These are the three pillars of creation. So the reason why creation took place is that is that the heavens and the earth will be established under these three pillars. Amen. And within the creation, God will demonstrate His kindness towards you. Jeremiah two two says. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentst after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. This is, a, this is a word that Jeremiah spoke, speaking about when Israel received the Ten Commandments at, 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 on the first Shavuot. When God came down upon Mount Sinai and he delivered the commandments. The rabbis teach, and the, mid, the Midrash commentaries teach us, that God actually lifted up Mount Sinai from the ground, and he turned it upside down, and it was like a wedding canopy over the nation of Israel. And Israel became a nation at Mount Sinai when they received the commandments of God. Amen? Amen. So, so God is, what God is doing, he is demonstrating his kindness towards you. God so loves you. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but receive eternal life. You know, many of us stay away from the Bible because we think it's too judgmental. And I believe somebody on Facebook Live tonight, somebody is watching tonight thinking, I, can't, I don't listen to preachers, I don't read the Word of God, because I'm afraid of judgment. And I, and I feel like I'm going to be condemned. You know, don't look at the Word of God in that way. God leads through the lenses of mercy. Just with my glasses to help me see, 
more clearly. We need to put in the lenses and see the Word of God the way God wants us to see the Word of God. And God leads with mercy. Amen? He does not lead through the eyes of judgment. Look at how Jesus dealt with the woman that was caught in adultery. He, first he asked all the people, all the religious leaders, he that, he that is without sin, hurl the first stone. And all of them were convicted of their sins. They dropped their stone, stone and walked away. Then Jesus looked at her and forgave her and told her, to, told her to go and sin no more. God is looking at you through the eyes of his mercy. And even as I'm teaching you Torah this evening, God is looking at you through the lenses of mercy. Amen. God so loves you. He's, you're so precious in, he, in his eyes. He, he so loves you. Let him lead you with the eyes of his mercy. Amen. Amen. And there may be areas in my life that need God's strict justice. You know what? Lord, please begin with mercy and then gently nudge me and correct me in the, er in the areas that I'm in sin. I don't know about you, but I always ask God to be gentle with me. Yes. Yes. And often my time in prayer with God is He also deal with my stuff, the stuff that's not right, things that I, I, I haven't, I haven't, you know, I, I, may, I may not have been very kind to Bishop Ed this evening. I may not have been gentle, and I'm just making this up. But you know what? You need to examine yourselves throughout the day and see in areas in your lives that need to be corrected. Amen? Amen? But know that God loves you. You're so precious in His eyes. And He so wants to use you. And He knows all your mistakes. I have not seen a single person in my life that's being used by God that is perfect. And you know what? I get comfort in that. Look at the ministry of Peter. How many times did Peter blow it? Countless times, right? But you know what? I love Peter, and Peter is my favorite person in the New Testament. And some of you are laughing at me because anyone I teach about becomes my favorite figure. Amen? So, <laughs> so the world is built upon three pillars, on Torah, on service to God, and on acts of loving kindness. We're still in Genesis 1-1. We, we, we will not make it past verse 2 tonight. But I want to, this Sunday, we are going to celebrate, we are going to experience a holy convocation. And that is the Feast of Shavuot. And I'm going to speak about Shavuot for a moment because it ties right into the purposes of creation. Let's talk about what happened during the very first Shavuot. Now, Shavuot is a Hebrew word that means weeks. In the new, and, it took, and we see it taking place in Exodus 19 and chapter 20. And then years later, 2,000 years ago in Acts, in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost was fully come. The day that we call Pentecost is a Greek word for meaning the 50th, but it's the, it's, it's, it, it is the very same day as Shavuot. Pentecost is not a new holiday. It's not a new feast. It, it's just been renamed in, in, the Greek, in, in the Greek, but it's the very same day. Pentecost is the very same day, the very anniversary of Shavuot. Amen? Amen. So during the very first Shavuot, we see in Exodus chapter 19, verses 16, 19 through 20. And it came to pass on the third day. Can you say the third day? The third day. That third day what on the Hebrew calendar is the sixth day of Sivan. Can you say sixth day of Sivan? Sixth day of Sivan. And that's the month we're in right now. We've entered the month of Sivan, and the sixth day will begin on Sunday. And it came to pass on the third day, which is the sixth day of Sivan, there were thunders, lightnings, does it look, sound familiar? Thick cloud upon the mount, a voice of a trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people in the camp trembled. And then God, God, God spoke. That was, that was the day in which Israel became a nation. Then, scrolling forward in time to Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Can you say the day of Pentecost was fully come? And, there, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Just like we see in Exodus chapter 19. There was a sound that came from heaven. And there was a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues of fire. We see fire in Exodus 19. We see fire in Acts chapter 2. And this Sunday, the, and it's going to begin tonight I believe, the fire of God is going to fall. The intense 
glory of God is going to fall in this house. And you are going to experience gifts of the Spirit of God, manifestations of God's glory that you have never known before. You're going to, you're going to break out a prophetic dance like you've never known before. You're going to move out to drama in the arts and in music and worship like you've never worshipped before. Because God is going to catapult you into a higher level in His anointing. Amen. Amen. And cloven tongues, like as a fire, sat upon each of them. The glory of God is going to rest upon each and every one of you. Amen? What took place here was not the born-again experience. What took place here was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I pray tonight, Holy Spirit, I ask you, to I ask you Lord Jesus, to baptize every one of us afresh with the Spirit of God. With a fresh anointing, Lord God. I'm asking you, Lord God, for a new gift of, 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 of tongues. I'm asking you, Lord God, to release to your people the interpretation of tongues. I'm asking you, Lord God, to resurrect gifts that have been dormant since, since the 70s, Lord God. To re even resurrect gifts that have been dead, been dormant since the, since the early days of your church, Lord God. I pray that the gifts that were manifest in the ministry of, Amy, uh, of um, Mary Woodward Eder, Amy Sample McPherson, Catherine Coleman, Smith Wigglesworth, Amen. Reese Howe. I'm asking you, Lord God, to resurrect these gifts in your people. Amen. To resurrect these gifts in your people. I'm just going to take a little, little uh, sidebar for a moment. How many of you have ever been to a Catherine Coleman service? And I'm not trying to give away your age, but I'm just, just asking a question. How many of you have ever sat in a Catherine Coleman service? Mother Aida, did you raise your hand? Okay, but in, in, in person. Anybody in person? We're in a new generation, aren't we? <coughs> I'm telling you, when I was preparing to teach on some of the great generals, and I remember speaking to our pastor, Dr. Corral, about it, I started experiencing an anointing that I have never experienced before, and it just came through studying, uh, studying the, the, these great figures in American history. And, and what I learned from pastor and from others about Captain Coleman is that when people would come in, into her services, even a, a, I think even I heard, read a story about a drunken sailor coming in. People that came in just to, came in to mock the anointing, to mock the woman of God. They walked out of that service saved, Amen. and many of them that came in doubting received healings. Amen. 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 You know we're always taught you must have faith to receive your healing. Well, you know what? You can throw that doctrine out the window because so many came into her services that that were healed in the services that were mocking and cursing God when they came in to the services. Some of them were even cursing when they, when, as they were falling down under the power of God. But you know what happened? Because you know God leads to the lenses of mercy. They left that service and a transformation was, was, began to take place. And many of them that were living in, in the lower echelon of society were being lifted up to higher levels in society. It was because of the anointing. And that was the anointing that was present in the latter days of Captain Coleman's ministry. I mean, those same anointings are coming back to the body of Christ. Yes. That means your character is going to be lifted up to a high new, a new level. Yes. Your, your kindness yes. is going to be lifted up. And, and you're going to truly love one another. Really appreciate one another. We don't no longer tolerate one another, but we truly love one another. When we, we're no longer busy competing with, with, with each other for whatever. Yes. Position's not real. Let's stop, let's stop seeking after that which is not real. And let's stop seeking after the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Because he, he is real. Amen. So, Israel became a nation on Pentecost. Jerusalem was recognized as the headquarters of, the, of, of Israel, as, as, as the capital of Israel during the week of Pentecost. This is the week of Pentecost. Yeah. On Monday, yeah. the, the, yeah. the American Assembly, the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem was inaugurated. Yeah. Amen? During the week of Pentecost. That is not a coincidence. Yeah. Amen? And just by the United States being the greatest super, superpower in the world, by this nation, and I'm so honored and proud to be a citizen of the United States, Amen. that during this very week, our nation recognized and, and, and inaugurated Jerusalem as the capital of the nation Amen. of Israel. Amen? I'm telling you, the blessings that are going to come to America in the next several years are going to blow, are going to blow, are going to blow every one of you away. The wealth coming into America, the jobs coming back into America, what God is going to do in America is going to be so phenomenal because this nation blessed the nation of Israel. Amen? Amen.
That was the conclusion of tonight's teaching, but I gave it to you in the introduction. And the conclusion of the world is Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3. This, a new heaven and a new earth. That is our final destination. And that will be book number 3. Book number 2 is earth, wind, fire, and a still small voice. Book number 3, I believe, will be called the final destination. And here is the final destination. Dr. Vicky, will you read? Uh, I'm just going to ask you just to read it to us. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Amen. Amen. That is our end. That is the completion of the seventh day of creation. This is entry into the eighth day. And this is, this is where we're going to dwell forever. In the eternal temple of Jerusalem. Amen. And when the temple comes down from heaven... This, actually, the new city comes down. The temple and the city will be the same. And that is where we're going to dwell forever and ever. There are some rabbis that teach, and I think this is in the Hazal, there are some rabbis that teach the third temple will not be rebuilt. The third temple will come down from heaven. It's my opinion that the third temple will be, will be rebuilt by Messiah when Messiah comes, and the fourth temple will come down from heaven. But that's up for debate, and it doesn't really matter where you stand on that. I just want to share different opinions with you. The beauty of Torah study is that we can approach it from many different opinions. And it's not that one opinion is right and one opinion is right, but in every opinion, there, there, there is teaching. Amen? And so, you know, we as Christians are taught there's only one right way. Well, if that's your opinion, then explain to me why do we have pre trip, mid trip, post trip. Um, Beliefs and when 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 you know when the tribulation is going to take place, I don't know when it's going to take place. I just know it's going to take place, and I and it's my opinion that we'll be taken away when Masa, when, Masa, when when Antichrist is revealed. Let me give you my opinion, and I'm going to, I, and I was I was like in prayer today. I go, Lord, I'm not going to deviate from my notes. I'm not going to deviate from my notes. Well, guess what? I'm de I've already deviated from my notes. <laughs> So, Sister Deanna, whatever I sent you, you can just delete that text because I'm going off on a, I'm going off on a tangent now. Um, there's, I mean, in, in, in Christian teaching on, in, on eschatology, uh, and I'll pronounce that correctly, in, uh, on end, end times, there are some of the belief, and I believe many of us have the opinion, that, that we'll have a pre trip rapture. That means before Messiah, before the tribulation, before the seven year tribulation period begins, there will be rapture. And there are those that have the opinion of the mid-trip rapture, and of that opinion that, will, that the church will be removed in the middle of that seven-year tribulation period. The third opinion is that the church is going to go through the, the, the seven-year period. Now, my opinion is, I mean, I, I grew up, I mean, I've been studying this stuff since I was like 11, 12 years old. I was glued to TBN for years and years. Listen, watching every single prophecy teacher they had. Hal Lindsey and there were several others. And after listening to them all, I left completely confused. <laughs> and I'm being honest with you. Because you know what? I was looking in the wrong place for the answer. The answer is found in rabbinic commentary. Amen. That's where the answer is. So I'm looking for the rabbis to teach me when the end's going to take place. But I'm, I'm going to parallel the end with Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. Do you remember when Joseph revealed himself to, to his 11 brothers saying, I am Joseph. Yes. Is my father still alive? Can you imagine the shock on, it, on, on, on their faces? <coughs> well, and before he revealed himself to his brothers, what did he do? He sent out all the Egyptians. Because he didn't want to humiliate, humiliate his brothers. He sent them out, then he revealed himself to his brothers. Joseph is a type of Messiah. Joseph, in the latter part of his ministry, represents 
the resurrected Christ. And I believe when he was thrown into the pit, that in, in that aspect of his life represents Christ's first part of his ministry, which led to his crucifixion. But when he revealed himself to his brothers, what did he do? He sent all the Egyptians out. And then he revealed himself to, he revealed himself to his Jewish brothers. This is what my opinion is of end times. Before Jesus, the Messiah, reveals himself to the Jewish people, because Jesus will not humiliate the Jewish people. The Jewish people are the chosen people. Yes. I believe the rapture will take place, the church will be removed, and that age of dispensation will come to an end. And then when the church is removed, the veil will be removed from the eyes of all Jews, and all of Israel will accept Jesus as the Messiah. Amen. Amen. That, that is my opinion in the order of events. If I'm wrong, we can debate it in heaven, because we'll all be gone by that time. But, um, but when, when, he when he does come, we go. Because I, I, I do not believe that God will shame his people. And if it were not for the Jews, we would not have our Messiah. We would not have salvation. Amen. Amen. I am forever indebted to the Jewish people. I love the Torah. I, 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 I love the Jewish people. I, I love Aish.com, Nala.com, um, YUTorah.org, um, Habad.org. All these sites are sites that I go to and I study Torah from. I love the Jews. Regardless of who they believe the Messiah is, I love the Jews and I thank them for the Torah. I thank them for the teaching. I thank them for all they've given us. I thank them for all that they've given me. Amen? Amen. And I especially thank our pastor, Dr. Michelle Corral, who in introduced me to Torah and through, through her teaching, has called, I have fallen in love with the Torah. Amen? Because I know my destiny is found in the Torah. And your destiny as well. Otherwise, you would not be here tonight. Amen? So we're going to begin. And I had no idea that Pastor was going to talk about this last night. Because we did not compare notes. So when she was teaching last night, I realized that what I had prepared fell right in line with what she was teaching last night. And that was from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And I'm going to ask you to follow along. Dr. Vicky, will you read Genesis 1-2? I'm going to talk to you about tohu and bohu, formlessness and void in the earth. Ready? Begin. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And yeah, we'll, we'll stop there because I'll probably spend about two hours just talking about part one of verse two. And the earth, I'm just joking, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So some, you know, so much, we have much teaching about what happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Genesis 1-1 in our King James says, in the beginning, God created the heaven, the heaven and the earth. Then verse 2, it says the earth was without form. So what happened, what took place? If you have a Dake's commentary, and I used to read the Dake's, I used, to read the, I used to read the Dake's commentary in, in the Dake's Bible. He would say that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, Satan came with, his, with one third of the angels and, and brought destruction on the earth, destruction in the creation. So God had to recreate starting in verse two, 3 and on. That is not my opinion. But that is, that is a, and, and I'm, not, I'm not discrediting those, I'm not dis Crediting those that have that opinion, it's just not my opinion. From Torah study, my opinion has changed. But my opinion at one time was that Satan brought the destruction. But one thing I want to tell the church here, you, you all give, uh, let me talk like a southerner, you all, all y'all give Satan too much credit. He doesn't deserve that much credit. He doesn't deserve that much blame. He's a creative being like all the other angels. He is limited, God is unlimited. Satan is finite, God is, 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 is infinite. Satan can only be in one place at a time, God is omnipresent. Amen. So Satan is not the opposite of God. If, if that's your opinion, you're giving Satan way too much credit. Amen? So here, is, now I'm going to give you Sanjay's opinion. And my opinion comes from the Jewish translation of Genesis 1-1. Not the King James translation. It begins with, in the beginning of God's creating of the heavens and the earth. 
T, doesn't that say that this is just the start of the creation? And then verses 2 and on talk about things coming into order. I like to, and I, I don't really cook, but if I, but, but I, like to, I like the analogies of those cooking, comparing the, the preparation of a meal with, with, with the creation. You know, uh, you, let's say you're preparing, bre you're making bread, and you prepare the dough, and you, you know, be and even before you, you, you knead the, the dough, you've added the salt and all the ingredients beforehand, right? So all the ingredients are already in the dough, but when you, when you put that, when you put that dough in the oven, it's going to begin to rise. Amen? So I believe in Genesis 1-1, when God, in, in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, what took place is everything that creation needed was already in that lump. And then from the rest of Genesis chapter 1, everything is coming into place. And I'm going to tie this in with your destiny in just a moment. So, and I believe when, in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, I believe that is the very instant in which the Big Bang took place. I don't understand the theories of multiverse. I don't understand all those, uh, uh, all those teachings that you see in, in different science programs. But I do believe in the creation of at least a universe. Amen? And I believe the, the creation of the universe began right in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And the reason why in verse 2 it was called without form and, and void was because God had not brought order to it yet. God had not separated all, all the gaps. You know, I'm not going to talk science right now. But God hadn't put everything in place yet. It was, it was still in a state of chaos. And guess what? Your destiny begins in a chaotic state as well. Every one of us has painful beginnings. Every single one of us has a painful beginning. And some of you have been through, through some of the most tremendous crushings, like the loss of a son. I cannot imagine the pain, and even the pain that Dr. Vicky even experiences to this day. But you know what? That pain has become part of her anointing. That pain is part of her, of her, of her spiritual DNA. And God is using that pain to deliver others. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And Dr. Vicky, I hope you don't mind me picking on you, but... Uh, this is the best example I can think of. I mean, it's through that crushing, through that pain, that destiny comes forth. And in the lives, and if I can be a little bit transparent with you tonight, when Bob and I, I went through the most horrific situation with, 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 with family, where we were completely separated and it happened within, within a day. Total separation. And my wife had only been in America for about seven years. Again, seven is a prophetic number. After seven years... And Bhavna, who had come born in a culture where family was so tight-knit and so tight with all the neighbors and so connected in the, in the, in the, in the little town of Billy Mora, and to come here in, into a Western culture where it's so extremely lonely, and to a place where in an instant she and I were completely separate from everybody. A total separation took place. But you know what? That's when the anointing came upon us for ministry. It was that I can remember the very day. I, rem I remember one thing. Within a week... Every, everything completely changed. And I'm telling you, and, and even today we still live with that pain, but God uses that pain for His glory. Amen. God uses that pain. I remember there's a lady I was speaking to a, a few weeks ago, and I won't use her name tonight, but I do pray that she'll come to Torah one of these days. And she, she was telling me a story about when her, her mother died. No, no not her mother, her, um, her, her father died. And, and, and left the, the mother and eight children. And, the, and one of the daughters took responsibility for the entire family. She said, I am not giving up my siblings to be adopted by different family members. I am going to take responsibility. And I can just see the pain in her eyes. I can see the love. She told me how close she is with her family members. And the love that they have for one another. And I'm telling you, God, I mean, God was at work. And I asked her, well, how, I mean, how could you take care of yourself? And then she said, she just knew the Lord, the Lord had already shown her that he was going to take care of her. He was going to take care of them. And the Lord took care of them. See how faithful God is? God is, God is going to take care of you. God is going to take care of you. I'm not sure if I lost the microphone. So... You and your lives, you, at times, you're going to feel like you've experienced a tohu and a bohu. The earth being without form, the earth representing your lives, 
things may take place, tragedies may take, take place. You may lose a son or a daughter, lose a family member, you may lose a parent. And guess what? In the midst of that, God is going to use you. God is going to bring reparation. God's going to use you to bring healing to other people. The Torah is going to give you the fortitude to be able to, to withstand the most, difficult, uh, the most difficult situations in your life. Amen? Amen? And at that, at that very darkest hour, the Spirit of God is going to move upon the face of your waters. The face of your waters. Some of you in this room are experiencing tremendous struggles financially. Some of you are going through the most painful situations with family. I mean, every one of you has a story. If I could sit down with every one of you, if I could spend an hour with each and every one of you, I would learn about the pains that you're going through. Not one of you is exempt from pain. And if you are, if you, if you are living a pain-free life, please, please come to the front and tell us your secret to a pain-free life. Because I don't know anyone in this house living a pain-free life except for Ravitz and Terry. Just joking, she, she lives a life with tremendous pain. Amen? So let's talk about tohu and bohu. The earth was without form and void. The word without form in Hebrew is tohu. Can you say tohu? Tohu. Tohu is an expression of astonishment and desolation. It speaks about formlessness, confusion, unreality, emptiness, nothingness, empty space, chaos, and vanity. How many of you like that place of Tohu? Not one of us. And then the, the other word to use is, is Bohu, and Bohu means emptiness, void, and waste. In some ways, the definitions are very similar. Now, I want to speak to you, I shall speak about this later, the, the three periods of human history, and you can get that in the, um, the second book, so I'll skip that for now. Your destiny is being transformed from tohu and bohu into purpose. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, your destiny is being transformed from tohu and bohu into purpose. None of us want to live with tohu and bohu, amen? No formlessness and no void. No formlessness and no void. Tohu and bohu have to go. Your life may have began with Tohu and Bohu, but your destiny is being transformed into a destiny of purpose. Amen? Amen. Pastor Michael, his destiny is being turned into a destiny of purpose. Amen. And Tohu, when the light shines, Tohu and Bohu will vanish. Amen. Amen? So your destiny is being transformed into purpose. Jeremiah chapter 1 speaks about... Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. So even before he formed you, even before you were conceived in your mother's womb, he already knew you. And your destiny may have be began with formlessness, but guess what? God's light is shining through, and he's forming your destiny. He's, he's already creating your purpose. He knew your purpose even before you were born. God knew that Rebitson Diana was going to perform the role of Esther, even before she even imagined who Esther. God already ordained that's part of her midot, that's part of who she is. God has designed her to be an Esther. Amen? Amen. And God designed Gregory, and he knew his, his turn was coming. <laughs> Last night was the first time I saw him play guitar. And I go, wait, he's at the guitar. On Sunday, he's at the drums. Then he's at the pulpit. And then he's... He's danced. He hasn't danced yet, but the dance is coming. The dance is coming. But I sent him a text earlier this morning, before I went to prayer. I sent him a text today, and I said, you know what, you remind me of an I Love You episode. Because I remember one I Love You episode where Rudy, Lucy and Ricardo came into a town, and they checked into a hotel. Well, this is the guy that checked him in. Then they had gone to a gas station, the same person ran the gas station. And I think they went to a convenience store, and I think the same person ran that store. This, 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 I don't, I, he, may, he may have been the mayor, he may have been the mayor too, I don't remember. It's been so many years since I've seen this. Was well, he the mayor as well? So it was, it was, it was basically a one-man town. So God is, turn, is transforming the tohu and the bohu into purpose, and the way you find purpose is through prophecy, amen? So when the prophetic word is being delivered through the Torah, 
guess what happens? That's when God starts revealing to you who you are in Him. I remember when I was 19 or 20 years old in this ministry, and I received probably the most amazing word of my entire life. I, and those words are still coming to pass to this day. Because I'm still learning in part what God wants to do with me. And I believe that every, each and every one of us, God, we don't know in fullness of where God's going to take us. It's being revealed to us little by little by little. Amen? Amen. So God is transforming the formlessness and the void in our lives into purpose. Now I'm going to skip forward to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to speak, we're going to, talk, we're going to follow the pattern of Genesis 1 and see the pattern that took, the pattern of Genesis 1 taking place in Ruth chapter 1. Amen? For those of you that are part of the MSC, the MSC program, you'll, you should understand what I'm doing here tonight. Is uh, I'm using rule number 7. Actually, is it rule number 7? Give me a second here. I'm using rule number 6 of the 7 rules of Hillel. The rule states, Kayotzi bo mimakon akar. Again, it's Kayatsi bo mimakon akar. And it means an analogy from another passage. It's like this somewhere else. So what we see in Genesis 1, it's like that somewhere else in Ruth chapter 1. Amen? So let's go to Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to ask Dr. Vicky to read. I'm going to ask all of us to read this together. So please turn to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Ready? Begin. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Amen. This is one of my favorite readings in the Torah, uh, in, in the um, in Ketubim. So here's in Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, it came to pass in the days of the, ju- the judges' rules. So we, we already know we're in the context of the judges. That there is yet no king in Israel, and everyone did that was everyone did that which was right in their own eyes, and there was a famine in the land. So it came to pass. Whenever you see the words "it came to pass," it's almost like reading "Once Upon a Time" in a Disney story or a, any kid's a fairy tale. "Once Upon a Time." Whenever you read "Once Upon a Time," there's something bad that's going to be taking place. Amen. Cinderella is being treated cruelly. Snow White was being treated cruelly. There's, you know, this, uh, but you know that, those are just fairy tales. But here is reality. Whenever you read, and it came to pass in the days, it's usually going to tell us that something negative is taking place. And the judges ruled, and there was a famine in the land. And there was a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, who went to sojourn in the land in the country of Moab. Everything taking place here is negative. It's nothing but gloom. What's taking place here is tohu and bohu. How many of you have ever, and I'm, I don't want any of you to raise your hands, but how many of you have ever experienced a time in your life where you can remember at this very time in my life, I made this horrible mistake in my life, and as a result, nothing but devastation occurred for the next several years? You know, some of us have experienced that. And I believe many of us have experienced that because we reap what we sow, amen? So sometimes we make a, tremendous, we make a, a horrible career decision. We take our family and move somewhere else. We do whatever, but it's not in God's timing. And as a result of our mistake, we will reap the mistakes that we make. Amen? I think all of us have done that from time to time. And what, what, what um, Elimelech did was so wrong. He was a judge in the land. He was ruling from, in Bethlehem. And there was famine in the land, and he was, a, he was a man of tremendous wealth. And he had the ability and the means to take care of all, all the starving people in the town. But you know what? He was greedy. And, and what did he do? He took his two sons and his wife, and they, as pastor would say, he hightailed it to Moab. When he should have stayed there, he should have encouraged, he should have taught the Torah, and he, he, sh- he, should have, he should have consoled the people during that time. But what did he do? He did the exact opposite. He fled. So, and the words, when the judges judged, you know, our King James says, the judges judged. But it should read, when the judges judged, this, this statement is not a, a historical statement, even though it is history. It, it, it's more of a moral statement. And what it means is that everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And the people did not respect the judges. And I'm sure Boaz, I'm, I'm sure not Boaz, I'm sure um, Elamelech was frustrated that, that the people would not respect his authority. 
But you know what? If the people don't respect your authority, there may be something wrong in your leadership style. We can't always blame the people when, when, when the people don't respect the authority of their leaders. Sometimes the leaders don't know how to lead. And I've learned the best way to lead is to become a servant of all. The best type of leadership is a servanthood type leadership. And it's not those that, that lead for the sake of, of ego. But they, serve, they, they lead through service. Amen? Amen? And Jesus demonstrated that even by washing the feet of his disciples. Let me add to this. So, the, the statement, judges, judges judging, is not historical, it's a moral statement. Scripture is not a history book, and it's not a story book. The, script, the, the Jewish people produced over one million prophets. I read this in one of the art scroll books. The Jewish people produced over one million prophets, but only 55 are mentioned in the 24 books of the Torah. Can you imagine? One million prophets produced by Israel, but of the million, only, 20, uh, only 55 are mentioned in the 24 books of the Torah. And these stories and prophecies were needed for, by posterity, meaning it's needed for all generations. So only that which is needed for all generations is recorded in the Torah. Now, I know that some of you like to look at other literature and and, and like look at books that are not considered inspired by God, and we, we go to these hidden books, or these lost books, or these lost whatever. You can go there, but if you do that, look at it just like opinion, but it, it is not the inspired Word of God. Amen? Amen. So be careful where you go and you say, if it doesn't line up with the Word, I would, I would, disregard, I would not regard it as authoritative. Amen. Because the Word of God, all 66 books in our, in our, in our Bible, are the words of Torah and they're timeless and eternal. That means it applies to all generations, all peoples. That's why only 55 prophets are recorded out of the million plus. And during the time when Elimelech fled, during the days, the days in which the judges judged, was a time when people did not respond well to their leaders. And they did not get the allegiance of their people. And everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. And Samuel, who is the author of Ruth and Samuel, 1 Samuel, for the, for much of 1 Samuel, is, 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 is emphasizing that Israel needed a king. They needed a strong leader. He was making a case for the need of a king. Because everyone did that which was right in their own eyes, and they did not, they did not respect the judges that ruled during that time. It was a chaotic time. It was a time of tohu and bohu in Israelite history. It lines right up with Genesis chapter 1. The earth was formless and void. Amen? But I'm telling you, whenever you go through that tohu and bohu, God is going to bring order. God is going is to shed His light. Amen? Amen? Even when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, He came during a chaotic time in Jewish history. The Jews were under Roman exile. And, and Ju the, the Jewish faith had evolved into multiple Judaisms. And all the groups were in tremendous disagreements. We have the, the Essenes, which is where John the Baptist probably came from. We, 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 who, who dwelt in, the, um, in Qumran. We have the Zealots, who wanted to overthrow Roman rule and establish the Israelite state. And then we have the, 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 the Pharisees. And even with the Pharisees, we had divisions, divisions of Pharisees. And then the fourth group, I believe, was the Sadducees. And the Sadducees denied the resurrection. They denied the existence of, of, of angels. And they denied the oral Torah. So there were so many divisions, even in the, in the times of Jesus. And Jesus, who is the light of the world, came to the earth during the most chaotic period within Jewish history. And Jesus came to repair the breaches. He came to bring correction in the way the Torah was interpreted. Jesus had not come to do away with the Torah. And when the scripture says that he came to fulfill the Torah, what he, the correct translation of that is, Jesus came to correctly interpret the Torah. Amen? Because Jesus is the living Torah. The Messiah is the living Torah. 
The Talmud says that, that when the people judge their judges, they actually criticize their judges. And if you look through the book of Judges, it says, Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Eight, chapter 18, verse 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Judges 19, 1. No king in Israel. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. What I'm bringing out here is a form of romance called Gezra Shabbat. We're seeing a repetition of the same word in multiple texts. And you can see the argument that, that um, Samuel is making. There was no order. There was chaos. There was tohu and bohu. And every one of us needs structure in our lives. For you to come into the fullness of your anointing, there needs to be structure around you. For Rebecca and Jasmine, for Rebecca and Diana, Pastor Michael, and everyone that's all of us, there needs to be structure around us. And we're not going to flourish, we're not going to grow in the things of God unless there's divine order. And God has established divine order in the church. God's going to place us around the right pastors. He's going to place us around the, the right teachers. Tonight I'm operating in, in, the, in, in the office of a teacher. And so every one of us is, is moved. Is God will place you around the people that are going to take you to the highest level to take you to the pinnacle of your destiny. Amen. And I believe in the pastors I have around me, they're going to help me in business. They're going to help me in ministry. They're going to help me in relationships. That every area of my life is going to reach the highest level of Amen. Amen. I know the books that Holy Spirit have me write during this time are not books for me. They're not books that are going to puff me up. It has nothing to do with me. It all has to do with God's work in these last days. To spread the Torah to the ends of the earth. And, to, and even to spread towards the Jews that have forsaken the Torah. Amen? Because there's something, because every one of you has a purpose in this earth. Every single one of you has a high calling in Christ Jesus. And through the blueprint of Genesis and the blueprint of Ruth, I believe tonight you're going to learn who you are in God. Because you are going to find your blueprint. Each and every one of you has a blueprint in creation. Amen? Don't treat this book like a history book. Because if you do, that's all you're going to get out of it. Treat this book like your very life it depends on it. And your DNA, your DNA is in this book. Amen? Amen. Right, Pastor Nelson? Everything that you need for your life, your purpose, is in this book. Amen. And through this book, this book is gonna, it contains the recipe for you to come out of tohu and bohu and come into, your, in, into the fullness of God's calling in your life. And then in verse 1, the latter part, a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. Let's talk about this certain man. This man's name, he was called Elimelech. I don't know if Elimelech was really his name, because whenever you see a Melech added to a person's name, it, us it usually denotes someone that's a ruler or royalty or some person of authority. Amen? Amen. And it says that he was a, an, e a, a, an Ephraite. A, an Ephraite. And Ephraim was the name of Bethlehem before it was called Bethlehem. So it can mean that he was, off, he, was, he was off Bethlehem, but it can also mean that he was a ruler in Bethlehem. I, I think it means that he was a ruler in Bethlehem. Amen? He was a judge in Bethlehem. And as I shared earlier, he, he hightailed it to Moab. And when he came into Moab, what took place? His two sons, <coughs> Malon and Kilion. Can you say Malon and Kilion? Malon and Kilion. Now for those of you that are... Uh, going to have kids, don't name your son Malon and Kilion. But I'm going to share with you what Malon and Kilion means in just a moment. I mean, Elimelech and Naomi were so respected and, and they were royalty in Bethlehem. And when they hightailed it to Moab, you know what took place? Their sons, Malon and Kilion, married the daughters of King Eglon. Um, Malon married Ruth and Kilion married Orpah. Ruth and Orpah were Moabitess princesses. So royalty marrying into royalty. Can you imagine you 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 know things are getting going really bad here in Anaheim, and you choose you can't take of all your family around you. And Brother Ed is tired of taking care of all these people, so he and his wife. Cheryl, they, they hightail it, so we're out of here, we're moving to Yorba Linda. So they, they leave Anaheim, and they move, they, they, they move north. They move to Yorba Linda, to the enclave. 
because they don't want to end. And as they're there, they have, well, there's some that marry now, but let's say there's, they have two sons. And they, and they have their sons marrying to, ro- to the royalty of your land. And this, it fits right in because we, we had a royal marriage take place this week, I believe. Did it take place already? No. Saturday. Saturday? Saturday? Okay. Thank you. So we do have a royal, place take, uh, a royal marriage taking place. But, so let's say they hightailed it to your land. And because of their high aristocratic position from Anaheim, they, they, keep, that, they keep that respect in your Belinda and their sons marry princesses of that region. That's kind of like what's taking place. That's a horrible analogy, but I, I just want to paint a picture of what was taking place here. And they dwell in the land for ten years. Elamelech died. And I think, the, and then later on, the two sons died. You know, God, when God is bringing judgment, he brings judgment little by little by little. Remember, God, God deals with us through the lenses of mercy. And then when the mercy is, is at a certain point, judgment will hit. So and what the rabbis teach us is that little by little, God started taking things away from El Amalek. But El Amalek wasn't repenting. They go, we have it good here. Brother Ed and Sister Cheryl, they have it good in your blender. They're prospering your blender. God... Be, so they're, they're, not, they're not going anywhere. But you know what? When God wants to, to move you back to some place, he'll, he'll deal with us gently, and he'll start stripping us and taking things, things away from us hope, in, in hopes that we will repent. But you know what? They did not repent. And what took place? Elimelech died, and Malon and Killian, they all died. And Naomi, we have th- now we have three widows. Naomi and her two daughter in law Ruth and Orpah, are, are, are all widows. So now they have come into a place of total tohu and bohu. And none of us want to live in tohu and bohu. I'm not saying, I'm not giving this word to condemn anybody. But what, what I want to share with you is when, when we're out of the will of God, sometimes we'll experience devastation out of our own um, <coughs> foolishness. Amen? And I'm telling you, I have made many, many mistakes throughout my life. Make many mistakes. I'm sure I'll make many more. But I hope Bishop Ed will keep me on the right path to where I will not make many more. And that's why I do. I hold myself accountable to, to some of you in this room. I hold myself accountable to our pastor, Dr. Michelle Corral, because I don't want to make those mistakes. And when I'm going off on a tangent of going where I don't need to go, often God will use pastor to, to put me in the right path. And every one of us needs that correction in life. Amen. And I, and I hope that some of you will trust me in that respect as well, because I don't want any one of you to fail. I want every one of you to move, to move in the full potential of your calling. I want you to move in the highest degree of your calling. I don't want any one of you to miss your mark. And I believe through this Torah, not because of anything I have, because I have nothing to give you, but I believe through the Word of God, through the, the help of the Holy Spirit, you are going to fulfill your high calling in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So that was a time of formlessness and void in the Elimelech bloodline. Now Elimelech, his name means, let kingship come to me. In Hebrew, names, the meaning of names is extremely significant. And actually even your English names, the Spanish names, or whatever origin your names are, they, they do have significance in Hebrew. Because in your name is your destiny. The name Elimelech means, let kingship come to me. And Elimelech knew that Messiah was going to come through his bloodline. His name prophesied it, let kingship come to me. So when Elimelech fled to Moab, he committed a very serious offense. Because he risked missing the coming of Messiah. Because how can, uh, you know, in our natural thought, how can, how can Messiah come in Moab? But you know what? God was already working behind the scenes. God had already set apart Ruth to be, to be part of the bloodline of Messiah. To be the part of the bloodline of Jesus. To be the great grandmother of King David. And Ruth being a descendant of Lot. Lot being a, 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 a nephew of Abraham. See, everything's connected. Everything is connected. There is so much destiny taking place. And even when Lot blew it, guess what? God did not forsake Lot. God restored Lot's name by using Ruth to, to, to bring the reparation of that bloodline. So it doesn't matter who's blown it in your bloodline, 
God can use you to bring reparation. Amen? Amen. So if it's formless and void, if it's total and vocal in your bloodline, God can bring reparation. If there's idolatry in your bloodline, God can use you to, to bring reparation. If there's adultery in your bloodline, God can use you to, 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 to fix that area. Amen? If there's, drug, if there's drug and alcohol bondage in your bloodline, God can use you to bring reparation. Amen? Amen. I'm not teaching tonight to bring anybody under condemnation, but, uh, but see what I'm teaching you through the lenses of God's mercy. Amen? Because God loves each and every one of you. And there's not one in this room that is without fault. And God is, God is not waiting for you to become perfect in order for Him to use you. He will use you right where you are. Amen? So if you've had relationships you should not have been in, whatever you've been in, God, God can use it for His glory. He will use everything for His glory. But don't use that as an opportunity to, to, to sin. Now let's talk about Malon for a second. Malon means sickness and disease. So don't name your sons Malon. Kilion can mean destruction or complete annihilation. See, in Hebrew, the names Malon and Kilion sound very similar to Tohu and Bohu. And that's what I want to parallel tonight is Genesis chapter 1 and Ruth chapter 1. This is not my teaching the teaching tonight. This is a teaching the Holy Spirit began giving to me around midnight on Saturday night. Because I was struggling all day, Lord, what do you want for Torah on Thursday night? And, and, and many of you don't know what I go through during the week in preparation, so I don't just I don't just pull a teaching out of that, out of anywhere. I go, Lord, what do you want your people to receive? Because it's not my word, and these people are your people. What have you ordained for the service on Thursday night? And right before I'm going to bed, the Lord drops the message in my spirit, and I go, Lord, could, could, couldn't you have given it to me six hours earlier? <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever said that. Because God gives me the word at the, at the, at the most inconvenient times. You know what, God? I want you to give it to me at any time that you choose. Amen. Whether it's 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. And for those of you that get my crazy text afterwards, please just, please just go, go with the flow. Because I'll, I'll start sending images during the week. Um, if I can tell you a little story here. And I think several of you were victims of my text this week. I think most of you in the front row here... Um, <laughs> Jasmine, Deanna, Michael. Michael actually uh, improved what I done. How many of you have seen the red hat that was used in the Trump campaign? Make America... What is it? Make America Great Again. Make America Great Again? Well, I found... A, I just started Googling it, make, make Your Own Hats. And I found this website where you can actually make your own hat. So I, I, I made my hat, Make Death and Fatora Great Again. So I had a beautiful hat... And I, and I hope we'll, I, I'm praying that we'll use it for a love gift very soon. But so, so I sent it to many of you this week, and I go, well, let me send this to Pastor. I don't send jokes to Pastor, but let, let me send this one. So last night after the service, see, Jasmine, I'm not kidding, I'm serious. After the service, I, I texted that picture to Pastor. And so when she got in the car last night when she was leaving the service, she, she just busted up laughing. And she texted me back, it is great and it will be great. Amen. 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 And I, I received that as a prophetic word from yeah. every one of you. Yeah. God is making death and Fatora. The name death and Fatora actually came when Bob and I used to drive past through services. And pastor was trying to come with a name Fatora. And I, and, I, and I go like, Torah for destiny? Torah for life? I think even Rosie was sending out emails to Torah for life. And I go, no, that's not it. And I remember just dropping my spirit one day. Destined for Torah, and I knew that was going to be the theme for the service. Amen? Amen. Because your destination is Torah. Amen. Everything in your life is Torah. Many of you might say, it when you're talking behind my back, that I have a, I have a one track Torah mind, and you're right. I, everything that I think about has to do with Torah. Even the jokes I send that have to do with Torah. Whether they're Star Wars, Star Trek, whatever, every joke I send out has to do with Torah. Amen. And the Jews are some of the funniest people I've ever heard. Their jokes are hilarious, but they're so Torah-centric that I, I told one pastor I've just become a Torah Greek because it will take me half an hour to explain the background before I can before you understand the joke. <laughs> so <laughs> God is taking you from Tohu and Bohu to destined for Torah, Amen. and even when you blow it. The seed of Messiah is still there. So even when El Amalek still blew it, God already has his purposes there. So you you know, don't 
Don't blame a parent. Don't blame your kids. Don't blame anybody. Everything that's taking place is total. Everything is good. Because we are called to, into God's high purposes. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And God is preparing your destiny in the midst of ruin. So in, in the greatest shambles of your life, that is when God is going to prepare your destiny. And I have not told you even a tenth of what I've been through growing up. The rejection, the hurt, the pain. But God has used all of it for His glory. Amen? And I'm the last person that I would choose to be used by God. Because it, 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 it's God's doing. Amen? God, God will use you wherever you are and use you for your glory and prepare your platform. Your platform is not Dr. Michelle's platform. Your platform is not Reverend Horkay's platform. Your platform is a pa- platform that God has uniquely designed for you. Amen? And for your Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And now, Dr. Vicki, can you take us through Genesis chapter 1, verse 2b. We've only finished the part of Tohu and Bohu. We're going to start with and the Spirit. Ready, begin. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Amen. Amen. Oh, that should, let's give you one more. <laughs> verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Amen. Thank you. Let's talk about what's taking place here. Let's go back to, the, to the Lord is preparing your destiny in the midst of ruins. Naomi, Orpha, and Ruth are in ruins. They're in poverty, and, uh, and their husbands are dead. And that is a part of your life that is tohu and bohu. But in the midst of that, the Spirit of God is moving upon the face of your waters. Let me read some rabbinic commentary here to you here. The Spirit of God was hovering. The throne of God's glory was, was suspended in the air and hovered over the face of the water. And it's almost like when, the, when, the, when Jesus was baptized in the rivers of Jordan, and when he came forth out of the water, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. So right in the midst, the spirit in the right in the midst of the ruin, the spirit of God is going to come upon you. He's going to hover over you, and the spirit of God is hovering over each and every one of you right now. He, he, he's, he's here to fulfill the, His calling upon your life. He is preparing you as a bride of Christ. He's here to purify you. He's here to cleanse you. He's here to anoint you. He's here to appoint you. He's here to He's here to use you. As a, as a peculiar creation in these last days. And family members will look at you and say, how can God use you? How can God use you? Amen? But you know what? I just laugh because it's God's doing. It's not my doing. Every, 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 each and every one of you can say that. Because the Spirit of God is hovering over you. He's hovering over your waters. The waters represent the Word of God. And when you have the Word of God, the Spirit of God will move upon the face of the waters, and He will perform every good word that's been prophesied over you. Amen? And when He moves over you, then you will arise. What takes place in Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 and 18? Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. She arose and knew there was bread in the land. She knew that the anointing was in the land of Israel. And she and, and she, she was moving back towards that land. But in the midst of the darkness, the light of Messiah will be revealed. Genesis 1-3, as Dr. Vicky read, let there be light. That light is not the light of the sun. What took place in Genesis 1-3 is Messiah was inserted into creation. The second person of the Trinity, Messiah, the Word, the living Word, as John t- tells us. He wasn't called Jesus yet. He wasn't called Yeshua yet. He was called the Word. And the Word, the person, the second person of the Trinity, was inserted into the creation by God the Father. I don't know how else to explain it. Because God exists in a realm known as in a, in, a, in another realm. And he created a finite creation. Then he took his only son, the Word, and inserted him into, into creation. So the very first thing we built into creation was Messiah. That light is a person. That light is not an it. That light 
that light in the spiritual realm is not E equals MC squared. That light in the natural is E equals MC squared. But the light I'm speaking to you now is in the spiritual realm. And Jesus himself, the Messiah, the living word, was inserted into creation. Amen? Amen. I said a lot there, but I, 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 don't, I will explain that some other time. So whenever you're in Tohu and Bohu, Jesus is being introduced into your creation. Amen? Amen. Would you like a little bit more tonight? Yes. Yeah. All right. All right, I'm going to, so, and then we see that the, all, all the creation taking place, and it was, and Jesus performed his word. He performed the word of the Father, and God said, and God said, ten times. And every time, and God said, Jesus performed the word, because Jesus is the word. Amen? God used the, the, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to create the creation. Well, God used Jesus, the living word, to form the creation, because Jesus is every living letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was good. It was very good. Can you say very good? Very, very good. And evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, this is the only day that's called the sixth day. The other days, the first day is just called a day, because only God exists in the first day. So, the devil was, didn't exist during the first day. Then the second day, the third day, the fourth day. No, it, no it, says sec, it says a day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. Then, this, then it says the sixth day. Because what God was saying here, what Moses was writing here, he was prophesying of a sixth day in the future. The purpose of the sixth day was prophetic of a future sixth day, the sixth day of Sivan, which which anniversary is this Sunday? Wow. Pentecost, Shavuot. The purpose of creation was the delivery of Torah into creation. Amen. The purpose of es- the purpose of Naomi and Ruth in exile was in preparation for them to receive the Torah, for them to prepare the way for the coming of Messiah, for them to prepare the way for the Davidic the Davidic dynasty. Because one of the pillars of creation is the Torah. So the reason why God is bringing each and every one of you out of Tofu and Bohu is to bring you into His purposes. Amen. To bring you into your high calling. Amen? Amen? God is, I mean, we're victims, Terry. What God is doing with you in this earth is so awesome. What God is going to do in these last days is preparing a new generation to serve God under the anointing. And everything that you've received over, the, over these 30 plus years, is going to, you, uh, God's going to use you to pour it out into young people to raise up a new generation that's going to be inspired for God. Amen. That are going to move Amen. in the excellent anointing. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, God is raising you up in the anointing of excellence. He's raising each and every one of you up. I'm telling you, I know most of you in this room. Actually, I think I know but just about everybody in this room. And I'm telling you, I am so honored to be in this room. I'm so honored to, to learn Torah with you. I'm so honored to be part of your life. I'm so honored that you consider me a pastor and a, and a friend and a, and a brother or, or a son or a nephew. I'm so, Bob and I are so honored that, that you have included us. And I'm telling you what God is going to do with each and every one of you is so phenomenal. You don't have to write a book. It doesn't, you don't have to preach from the pulpit. Allow God to do with you what He wants to do with you. Amen. Allow Him. Allow Him to do what He wants to do. And allow Him to bring correction when you need correction. The worst place that any of us can be is when we like our tofu and bow. Wow. We enjoy it. I like it like this. Leave me alone. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm within my tofu and bow in Auntie Terry, Auntie Marilyn. Uh, <laughs> please don't correct me. I like my tofu and bow. No, but you know what? I go, Lord, even when I like that tofu and bow, Lord, please let me be open to correction. I want the correction. Yes. Yes. And I'm telling you, some of these corrections are not very easy to take. Mm-hmm. But you know what? It's worth it. I'd rather be corrected. Yeah. I'd rather be corrected. Can we, let's just stand. Let's just, let's just worship the Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, tonight, I just ask you to touch everyone in this room. And Lord, I, I, I'm going to ask all of you to stretch your hands towards my tongue. And Lord, tonight, I ask you, Lord God, I ask you, Lord God, that you will minister your love, Lord God, and minister your destiny. 
Minister your highest calling, Lord God, upon everyone watching online tonight, Father God. Tonight over Facebook and, and those that will be watching on YouTube over the next couple of weeks. That, Lord, I ask you, Lord God, that, to release the anointing into every room, into everyone watching their homes tonight, Father God. That the glory of God will be sent forth, Father God. And Lord, I pray that everyone that feels like they're in total vocal, that you will resurrect them from their, their ruins, Lord God, and launch them forth into your high calling, Lord God. Use them for your glory, Lord God. And, and raise them up, Father God, and may they move in your highest calling, Lord God. Because the Spirit of God is moving upon the face yes. of your waters. The Lord is moving each and every one of you into destiny. I ask you right now just to receive the prophetic word. I see the light of God coming to many of your minds yes. right now. I see the light of Jesus being released. Just receive that anointing right now. And just move in His glory. Move in His presence. I see depression breaking right now. Yeah. I see sickness is being broken right yeah. now. I see yeah. desolation yeah. being broken right now. I see tohu and bohu being removed. Yeah. I see spirits of, of suicide being broken right now, Lord God. Yeah. That those are that we commit suicide tonight, Lord God. That that spirit is being destroyed right now, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for resurrection. I thank you, Lord God, for the blood. And if you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that salvation is found in your name. And I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. For if I can have you to lead us in the song. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. And let's just, let's just all worship. This is one of my favorite songs. Oh! 